the friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. To get the Crime Writers on After Show right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts, and on this episode, a letter outlining a plot to radicalize British schools led to ruined careers, national scandal, and hardline surveillance policies. Was there actually an extremist plot, or was it written for a different reason? We'll discuss the podcast, The Trojan Horse Affair, from Serial Productions and The New York Times. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of These Are Their Stories podcast, My Funny Valentine and Love of My Life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Happy Valentine's Day, Rebecca. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you for that awesome Valentine's gift you got for me. Uh, This welcome is in lieu of a card. (laughs) Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of Dead on Deadline, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. Good evening, Rebecca. And that is still the best-selling book in Exeter, Dead on Deadline. Congratulations, Laura Brecker. You are the queen of Exeter, New Hampshire, as we know. I try. And finally, she's like the Lady Elaine of Exeter, New Hampshire, right? You mean from Mr. Rogers? (laughs) I can get my tiara if you would like that, if you really want me to, like, embrace this. Do you have a museum (laughs) go-round? Like Lady Elaine Fairchild? Lady Elaine Fairchild, that's right. Yes. Oh, no! You <laughs> and finally, our captain of all things cynical, the author of the City Trilogy, host of Strange Arrivals, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hey, Rebecca. And our Daniel Striped Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He should be a little puppet. Daniel Striped Tiger was cute. Ding, 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 ding. What, what, what was the ding, owl's ding, name? X yeah. the Owl. Do you X guys know Owl, owl Correspondent School? <laughs> do you guys remember when i learned that mr rogers did all the voices of all those things which i didn't know before? your mind was fucking blown <laughs> no idea no idea i was a real stupid kid um so kevin you never wondered why you didn't see mr rogers there i just figured he was back at the house uh, hanging that, out doing the King dishes friday sounded just like x sounded just like i didn't mr pick, rogers i didn't no. pick up on that Never picked up on meow, that. Meow, 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 pays attention, meow, meow. Never paid attention to that one. Yeah, all right. All right, so Kevin, um, quick question. Uh, this show drops on Monday, and as you know, we now have two programs a week. Uh, what are we talking about on Thursday's podcast? Coming up on Thursday, we're going to be talking about the Netflix documentary, The Tinder Swindler. Oh, yeah, we are. We sure are. I can't mm-hmm. wait for that one. Well, we have a lot to talk about on this podcast, though, so I think we should get to it. Should we do that, Kevin? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's drop that first clip. It's unsigned, undated. Didn't it look like a serious document, did it? It just seemed comical. Think, well, what the hell is this? I remember looking at it for some time and thinking, what on earth is this? The infamous letter. Was it written on parchment, in blood? <laughs> so you're presenting me with a document that turned our lives upside down. In 2014, a letter emerged detailing an elaborate plot by Islamic extremists to infiltrate schools in Birmingham, England. It became known as the Trojan Horse Affair. The public was panicked, investigations were launched, careers were ruined, and British security policies took a drastic anti-Muslim turn, all based on what was in this anonymous document. The letter is what put the idea in authorities' heads. So I didn't see how you could know what Operation Trojan Horse was or wasn't unless you got to the bottom of the Trojan Horse letter. Who wrote it and why? 
When journalism student Hamza Syed met podcaster Brian Reed, he told him about the scandal and the unexplored question of the author's motives. They teamed up to investigate where the ham-fisted letter came from in the first place. And if there was no extremist plot, what was the writer actually hoping to achieve? And here we are, years later, at the end of a dizzying, farcical, and enraging investigation in which one mystery led to another, led to another, tracing this letter's path of destruction across multiple continents. In defiance of many unhappy officials and some aggressive attempts to shut our reporting down. From Serial Productions and the New York Times comes the Trojan Horse Affair. We follow Hamza and Brian's frustrating journey to explore whether the letter was more about a labor dispute than an extremist conspiracy, and would proving its mundane origins upend the official narrative used as a pretext for a lasting hardline government response. All right, so Kevin, the format of this podcast, we have Brian Reed, uh, uh-huh. host of S-Town, longtime This American Life reporter and part of the serial podcast team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have Hamza Syed, who at the time when he met Brian Reed was a journalism student, former physician, by the way. We should say Hamza Syed is no green. Uh, underachiever. Cow-eyed, Got it. like <laughs> underachiever. He's a smart guy. I think it's uh, fair to say probably smarter than all of us, probably smarter than Brian Reed in the aggregate. Are you um, trying to hurt me? No, I'm okay. trying to say, um, but there is a back and forth here, which... Uh-huh you know, is a format that doesn't always work. He was speaking fast, like I might walk away at any moment. To be fair, I was told that I had five minutes with Brian Reed, after which I'd be squirted out of the building. I did not know that. How do you think it works in this podcast? Because there are long oh, stretches where yeah. there are like long stretches of Hamza, there are long stretches of Brian, but at the very beginning of this podcast, there is interaction between the two, and how do you think this works formatically? I think it works very well here, and you're right, it doesn't always work well in some podcasts. Some There are podcasts that have two hosts, and they usually trade back and forth, but they're not just like trading lines or paragraphs here in a script. They really are sort of bringing their own personalities into what they are saying when you're going back and forth. Sometimes it's almost like they're bringing different character points of view, narrator points of view. So this is what Brian is seeing, and this is what Hamza is seeing, sometimes in the same, you know, exchange when you're talking about the same interview, what they're they're coming to. So, you know, the writing in this is so great that it really just kind of flows because there's superior tape to lean on and a lot of extemporaneous stuff where we interactions between the two of them. So they're both really fully fleshed out as hosts and narrators. And the deliveries are very natural, so they can get away with, you know, sort of the corny jokes. Even when the the story itself becomes rather dense, it's still interesting to listen to because it seems sort of effortless how they are taking us along. So, Laura, you sent me a note that really surprised me. Oh. You sent me a note. It really did. You sent me a note that you thought it was irresponsible of the serial team to send a green journalist into the world. Is that really what you think happened here with this project? Well, the way that I feel when I listen to this is that we have Hamza, who, you know, obviously, like you said, a very smart guy, has really not earned his journalism chops. Like, we all had to, like, cut our journalism teeth doing, like, boring stories until we learned the ropes. And here he is, thrust into the, like, top podcast sphere in the world for his first, you know, story out of the gate. To me, That I felt like, I don't know if irresponsible is the word that I want to use, but to me, like, I think as I'm hearing a lot of parts of this that I'm like cringing at where there are things happening where I'm like, "Eh, eh, eh." I'm like, okay, that's because this guy has no prior experience reporting on anything until this huge story, which isn't even like a newspaper story. It's a story that's like, hello, I'm in serial. Like I went from Being a doctor, I might go become a journalist to poof, I'm in serial. So I I feel like that was quite a leap. And I think, you know, in listening to this, I do wonder if that was actually part of why Serial took this story on with him as the co-narrator in this, because that was an interesting angle. Somebody that doesn't have the background in terms of the traditional journalism approach of going into something completely objectively, going in in a form of activist journalism as their first story out of the gate. 
And contrasting that with somebody that is obviously coming from a different, more traditional background. But I, I did feel like that. I felt like, okay, like, what are we going to just wind this guy up and see what happens? Uh, okay, have at it. So to me, I guess probably just because I didn't love this podcast, I, I guess I'm going to just put that out there right now. I think that was one of the things that I was just kind of like, eh. when it started, it kind of like gave me a little bit of a twinge. Okay, so Laura... Uh, We are going to fundamentally disagree on this. And here's why. You said a few things in what you said. You said the words activist journalism, which I I disagree that that's what Hamza was going at this with. And we'll talk about this more. And um, you said a couple of things about what the podcast does and and the journalists they sent into it. I think that's what the podcast is actually about. I do think the podcast is about the Trojan horse affair and the investigation into the ramifications of it and how it started and how it played out. I also believe the podcast is about whether or not the way you were trained to do journalism and the way Kevin Mm -hmm. was trained to do to learn journalism and the way Toby was trained to learn journalism and the way I was trained to do journalism and the way Brian Reed was trained and the way everyone thinks journalism is supposed to be done is broken. Was it the right way? Is it flawed in systematic ways that actually make hold us back from fundamental truths? I actually think that is a huge part of what the podcast is about. And I think it's also about the Trojan horse affair. And I think that um, the things that you just talked about actually is actually part of the plot in in many, many ways. But I I, I do see, though, by the way, because I do see a lot of the same reaction that you had playing out with other listeners. So I'm not discounting your opinion. I just think that that is just it's sort of literary, this podcast in a way for me. I think that you can come at it with different interpretations. Toby, because you sent a note, too, that said, like, you have two minds about this. I mean, I guess fundamentally, my question is, like, Toby, what do you think this podcast is actually about? Um, So I think there's two things going on. And I think you were kind of talking about that is one is there's the obvious story that it's about, which is, you know, the Trojan horse letter. And then this sort of quest to sort of understand, you know, the dynamics of it and and what decisions were made and what people thought about it that turned it from being this quite obvious fake into this thing that was able to drive education policy and anti-extremism policy and stuff. And then the second part of it, which I thought was sort of more interesting in some ways, I mean, it is like, it's one of those like buddy films, right? It's like, You've got Brian, who's, you know, an experienced journalist and it's pretty laid back and, and sort of self-reflective a lot. I, I mean, Ham's is self-reflective too, but Ham's is, you know, is, is much more, he's less patient. He gets angry at people, but he's driven in, in sort of a different way. It's so weird to have someone make you feel like you're doing something criminal. That move of trying to criminalize what you're doing, which is completely upfront and decent. You're you know, str- you're struggling with this more than I am. I'm a fucking minority, mate. My entire life is this. Why are we doing this story? <laughs> Do you realize the story you're reporting on who you're talking to? It's so weird to have people criminalize you, you know, normal behavior. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, you know, man. You got me. <laughs> So that dynamic, I thought, was really interesting. And I do think, I mean, I think it brings up a bunch of, I feel as though, right, there is this kind of BS about both sides-isms and, you know, that you have to be this, like, neutral observer and just the facts and stuff like that. that that's not really journalism. And so what Hams is doing, I think, is is sort of vital. It was interesting because I think Ahmed's the one who sort of sums up some of the difficulties that Hams had gets himself into sometimes or undermines some of the reporting that he's doing. He says, you know, just keep your mind on the goal, right? So instead of like feeling as though you have to, you know, get into arguments with these people or or get sick of it, like keep, what are you trying to get out of this interaction and get that? Because I feel like that's like some of what Brian wanted to say at times. And there's, I guess we'll we'll probably talk about this. We will. like one of the most interesting parts I thought was when Hamza sends the letter. Yeah. Uh, am yeah. I jumping too far ahead? No, you're not. I mean, I, I'll say- That's where I wanted to go. Yeah. Can I just can I just react to one thing that you said, Toby? Sure. You, see, you talk about Brian as being laid back, but also Brian is so privileged that he can choose stories because he thinks they're interesting. Hamza's choosing stories because he thinks they're vital, right? So there's a difference there. And I think that the other thing, the difference, what Ahmed is telling Hamza and what Hamza's reacting- Hamza's angry because this is his life. 
what Hamza is reacting to is when Ahmed says, you just have to be better. You just have to calm down. And Hamza is like, you know what, man, that doesn't work. This is what we've been told forever, <laughs> that we have to calm down. We have to be better. You got to stop yelling at people. I think you can say exactly what you're saying and not yell at them. Fuck That's that, what turns mate. them off. I don't give a fuck, mate. That's, that <laughs> doesn't want to turn them off. That's what gets them to finally just stop fucking around. This isn't a fucking joke. You're asking me what did the Trojan horse do? Fuck this, mate. I remember this whole podcast. And Hamza is not an 18-year-old kid. He is a grown-up man. He is a physician. He has been doing better. He has been being calm. He has done all of those things. And now he has decided to change careers for these reasons. Like, it's so, for me, it changes the perspective for me so much when I think about it that way. I guess the only question, and, and, I, and I get that, and I'm not... He's obviously very accomplished, very smart. He knows exactly what he wants to get, and he is dogged and successful in getting it. I mean, my my only thing is, it, it seemed like there were things that got cut short, right? Mm-hmm. Where he was like, finally, he just had his like, you know, this is such bullshit. I can't take it anymore. So I'm going to engage you in that in that way rather than keep you talking. He wasn't um, wrong. It was bullshit. Right. But if he, but <laughs> you know, if he's trying to get taped for this show. It's probably better to keep them going. Anyway, Kevin. Yeah, well, there's like a, th- a recurring theme here. And I, I think the actual story is 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 really fascinating. And I do want to talk about that. We but will. there is a theme that runs throughout this because it's more of a journalism look from the inside out. But there is a tension here between the old school, we'll call it objective journalism, and a new thought about activist journalism. Maybe I'm not using those terms correctly, but I think everybody gets what I'm going at. You're right. There was a really interesting scene with Brian where he was talking. They were talking about stories. And one of the big questions, the other theme is, would this make a difference? If the truth is known, does this change anybody's mind? And Brian talks about how what he likes for a story is something that's a hell of a story. Do you think it will change anyone's mind about anything? Is that even an important ambition to hold or does it not matter? I don't think about that when I'm doing a story because I feel like it will often lead to disappointment. The things that motivate me to do a story are because it's a good ass story. And maybe that's privilege. Yeah, you can't argue it that. Is. <laughs> but, but look at it, it is. The other thing is though, but people like well, when they say, Oh, you're doing you're a journalist, you're doing this for clicks, you're doing this for views and ratings and stuff like that. Reporters don't do it. This is absolutely true. They are motivated by this is a good story. They keep at it because they enjoy the story. The idea that, oh, it's a business, that's somebody else's thing to worry about, right? But There is this idea that this means more on a different level for Hamza, and maybe it should for Brian. They're coming together in the middle there, seeing each other's view here. There is this scene about the letter where Brian needs to gently admonish Hamza for the letter for the reasons why does Hamza's way not work? Because after this letter, what ends up happening to this story? We never get to hear from the principal. We never get to hear from those teaching assistants. We never get to hear from a bunch of people because he went on record saying, I don't believe them. Right. And it really damaged what they were able to do to tell this story because of that. So that was a mistake. You know, even though- It was a mistake to reveal what he thought. It wasn't a mistake to think it. No, 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 no. That's, That's absolutely true. But Brian was telling him it was a mistake to think it. I didn't hear him say that. He, no, that was the question, was keep an open mind, don't think it until you gather everything. Uh-huh. But I want to be clear, like, I'm open to any possibility, you know, of the truth here. I'm the same, the same, right? You know, yeah. And I think you are too. I, like, you know, I don't, I read this and it doesn't feel accurate uh, to how you feel. Hamza was saying, but that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. The mistake was the tactics. I believe, and I'm going to tell you this. A lot of what I felt, and granted, it's not exactly the same, I'm not going to pretend it is, is the difference between being a journalist as a man and a journalist as a woman, right? Uh Uh-huh. I feel this all the fucking time, that a man can go, like, cover something and feel, like, open to hearing things and, like, stand there and, like, to just be there in good faith when when they're hearing things that are not being said in good faith and they can stand there and nod. And as a woman... You know something's not being said in good faith, and you're supposed to be able to stand there and nod, but when you ask questions back, it's just not taken the same way. And that's, and and with Hamza's tactical mistake was putting it in writing. Uh-huh. That was a tactical mistake. It was not wrong for him to believe 
that those were lies? Because they were. Oh, yeah. No. I mean, that's if they motivates <laughs> the investigation. Reed, Brian yeah. Reed was basically saying, you're not supposed to believe that. You're supposed to believe nothing. That's what he was it's saying. It's a way of putting it. But again, you don't want to be blinded by what the outcome is supposed to be, right? You're supposed to investigate it. And then you're talking about confirmation bias. You'd yell at a cop for doing that. Why wouldn't you yell at a journalist for doing that? The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. Jewelry isn't a gift you give just once. It's a way to remind your loved one of a beautiful moment every time they see it. Blue Nile can help you find the gift that says how you feel and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com to find the perfect jewelry gift for any occasion. BlueNile.com. Can we take a break from all this talk of documents to read over my notes about the business section? Of course we can. Uh, business section time. So right now on Patreon on the Crime Writers on After Show. Yes. Following up on something that we put in our newsletter. Yes. By the way, telling you right now, if you haven't already, go to crimewriterson.com, stick in your email. You'll get our weekly newsletter. Yes. You find out all sorts of stuff. You can see photos of the cat of the week, and we have Crime Writers on behind the scenes, and we asked a specific question. Actually, we asked two questions. We also talked about this in the show last week, by the way. Right. Two questions. One, today's Valentine's Day, and we asked folks about roses on Valentine's Day. Mm. Do you expect them? If you don't get them, do you get upset? Nope. We got some different responses from folks about what that means as far as what they expect on Valentine's Day. Yep. Also, we asked people to talk about what Laura should name her office in downtown Exeter. Her enterprise. What she ought to put on the door. On the shingle. The clubhouse is what they call it in Exeter. The clubhouse. So... <laughs> We're going to talk about some of the email responses we got to both of those things. Can I just say something? Yeah. I love when our listeners send us email, and we love talking about their email on the show and on the after show. So please send us an email if you have questions, if you have feedback, if there's stuff you want to know about us, or if there's true crime updates or other things we should talk about on the show, send us an email at crimewriterson at gmail.com. We read every single one of them. Right, Kevin? Yes. And also want to let you know that it's not too late to sign up for the live broadcast of Married With Podcast. Broadcast. Yeah, that's on Patreon. We're going to be doing it on Crowdcast. Uh, and you can just go and click on the old button there, and you can watch Rebecca and I take your relationship questions, do it live, and then you can also ask your own or maybe offer your advice to folks who need a little bit of it. I believe that should have been Rebecca and me, by the way, Kevin. Because what, you're supposed to go first? Is that? <laughs> no, it's Rebecca and me. You can, because you were going to say you would watch me. So it should have been you would watch Rebecca and me. Just saying. You, you, you correct my grammar all the time. Oh. I had one opportunity there, so I took it. So if I said, kiss my ass with that, <laughs> is that the right way? Okay. <laughs> and it's home in, not hone in. Anyway, go ahead, Kevin. What else we have going on our Patreon? Is that it? That's it. All right, Kevin. So does that wrap up the business section? That does wrap up the business section. All right, I'm going to fade that music out right now. All right, so let's talk about this letter. Laura Bricker, there is some question as to whether or not this letter is authentic. And I think a pretty clear line, even though the journalists here aren't able to conclusively prove it, but they do seem to solve who wrote the letter and why, are you surprised that other journalism outlets didn't get there as quickly and as easily as Brian Reed and Hamza Syed, journalism student and reporter from Serial, who parachuted into this story, were able to get there with literally their first interview and then were able to draw a straight line into who it was who probably actually wrote this letter? 
Well, in just doing a little bit of background on this this story, it seems like people did not want to hear about the Trojan letter affair any longer. And I don't think that that was the focus of what people were interested in at the time. And I won't necessarily say everything that Brian and Hamza did was easy because a lot of it I just felt like was like knocking on doors, spinning wheels, going places, looking for information, getting stonewalled. But I I don't know, to me, if it was actually important who wrote the letter. Hmm. I mean, I know that's the premise of this podcast, but I guess... To me, that wasn't what I came away with at the end of this, thinking was the important part of this story. Yeah. So to me, that wasn't the story. The story was uh, these two guys going on this journey. It was the background about like all of this racism that's going on in the school system and the cover-ups that are going on. But in terms of who actually wrote the letter, when I finished these eight episodes, that was not the question at the top of my mind of what I felt needed to be answered. That being said, it was totally Mrs. Dar, right? <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, come on. I was just like, I mean, Toby, that's my opinion, by the way. I mean, I think that the, they speculate that in the podcast, clearly. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. But Toby, I mean... I think that like the entire thing with the fake resignations of these teacher assistants and then the way that this letter shows up to clear out all of these scandals. I mean, it is it's astonishing that a fake letter would then be the solution to a scandal driven by fake letters. It really is. It's very junior high in many ways when you think about it. Right. Uh, yeah, I I mean, that part of it just seems almost ridiculous yeah. if it didn't have the effects that it did. But these like, I'm going to write a fake letter and send it to somebody and maybe that'll like show them my, especially with the timing and how sort of ham-fisted it is. And then it's coming, as you said, on the tail of three other fake letters that she wrote. So, you know, she's got her MO and in the end it worked out for her, <laughs> regardless of how sort of ludicrous it all was. Just the whole situation. Can you imagine someone say, well, I've received your letter of resignation. You're like, what letter of resignation? Or to be the boss and say, I'm being uh, brought up on a grievance by these people, and here's how I'm going to get rid of them. I, I accept your resignation. And this letter, you know, to forge a letter. It was such a crazy story to start with. Yeah. It makes it believable yeah. that the only way she could get out of it, when she was going to be hung up financially, the city wasn't going to back up her claims if she goes ahead and fires them. It would be to one up everybody with right. a more sensational letter. And because of this, this whole thing spun out of control. It was a convenient excuse by politicians to then implement anti Muslim counterterrorism, and I put that in quotes, uh, policies that are still in effect today. Well, it ended up dismantling what before then was in many ways an incredibly positive outcome. Mm -hmm. And this was the thing, Laura, I yeah, kept thinking about. Show that, yeah. Well, I kept thinking about, like, Laura, conversations we've had so many times about, like, mm -hmm. you know, schools that we've sent our own children to because of, like, non-traditional non environments that, like, didn't work for our own kids. Like, here's a country where it is actually mandated to have some sort of religious element in public schools, which, by the way, was not a thing I knew before. Like, surprise, yeah. England, that was, I didn't. Didn't know about that. And uh, by the way, Islam can be one of the things you'd have to apply. And they say yes. And that can be the thing. And this this school went from like a single digit percentage success rate to a high double digit percentage success rate because this man came and turned the entire thing around. And the mm -hmm. whole thing was we create a community for you. And um, it was working. Students didn't complain. And there, there were glitches along the way. Obviously, there were problems like there are at any school. But like there were internally completely separate of this other school, completely separate of all this other bureaucratic fraud nonsense, there was a Karen <laughs> um, who sent her own set of anonymous letters complaining to the Humanist oh, Society yes. oh, her. <laughs> about what she perceived to be some serious uh, problems going on at this school. So what did you think of our friend Sue, Lara? Because I, I just kept thinking about how you might react if you were like having a long tea and discussion with Sue and, and hearing her describe. I would punch Sue in the face. <laughs> That's what I would do to Sue and her freaking husband. If it's true that children said in a class that homosexuals should be thrown off a cliff or burned alive and a teacher agreed, 
you never mention it again when you're when you're because, on the stand or in giving evidence. Because Why? I I wasn't witness to that, but I know other people were. So the reason is because it was hearsay. Is that why? A lot of things are hearsay, aren't they? I, I've seen people like Sue in my small town um, life. And I think what was ridiculous about her is how far her, like, anonymous, not anonymous complaints got and the impact they had and the fact that people just, like, took them at face value and didn't follow up further and the fact that then when uh, Brian and Hamza go and, like, speak to her and her husband, that they still don't, like, see anything wrong with this. And then, oop, surprise, her husband also was at the school and got, like, passed over for something. Ha-ha. Um, like, the, the whole thing, y- you know, but that's the thing is that, and I see this a lot locally. Um, I, I had my own big school fight last weekend. It was very exciting because I got to, like, actually – create some change in our school district. But at the same time, there are people like Sue who come forward every year and certain people believe everything they say and don't fact check them or question them or look underneath to see what's actually really happening there. So, but also in the bigger picture, this sort of tied into this issue we were talking about before where we have Hamza who's coming into this obviously with sort of a vested interest in this story because of his own feelings about what happened in this case. And then you see somebody like Sue and you're like, yeah, absolutely. This is bullshit. And there's this, you know, undercurrent of racism and like white privilege that's running through this education system. But fuck you, Sue. Anyway. Yeah, it was telling that in all the complaints that she made about seeing uh, women at the school being, uh, disadvantaged or abused or whatever it is that they all disagreed. You know, they said, no, that isn't what happened. She was definitely projecting no, something. they were mad at her for doing yeah, it. Yeah, they were mad at her. Well, but they were also like, you That know, wasn't my experience. That wasn't my, that's, yeah, that isn't Not what happened. Not only wasn't so, that my experience, but she shouldn't have done that. And I'm angry at her for doing it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't think that wherever Hamza was coming from, wherever Brian was coming from, makes a difference. I think that Sue was an asshole. And it sounds like her husband was fine. And I don't want to say, like, you know, I'm not the kind of person who says, like, oh, the evil woman came along and, like, steered the man off course. But it does sound like he was fine in that school until she came along and pushed him off course. It's hard to tell you've married a Karen until she becomes the Karen, right? <laughs> That's true. That is absolutely true. All right, well, I, I want to talk about um, just a formatic element of the podcast because... Laura's mentioned it in her notes. I have had conversations with other friends who've listened to the podcast. I don't think it's an issue you and I particularly had, Kevin, but it's something that's come up with our, our, our fellow panelists here in their notes. We do get in the weeds a lot with bureaucracy and documents in this podcast. Toby, did you feel like there were, there were sections of this show that felt like a slog for you? You know, it wasn't so much that it felt like a slog, but it is different in that I mean, you really are spending like literally hours and hours sifting through the details about who was in a room when somebody was opening letters or who saw a audit and when and when was it retracted and why was it retracted? So it's a lot of it is about, you know, the gears of, of government, including, you know, school governments, I guess. That being said, you know, I, I sort of found it all pretty interesting we're really talking about stuff that happens all over the place all the time. Just in this particular instance, it's like super, super messed up, but it is, it's the ordinary stuff of governance. Hmm. Right. And and that's sort of what they're trying to kind of pull apart and figure out how did this clearly on the face of it, BS letter send everything so far off the rails and why didn't any of these other things that should have been able to have stopped it or these people who should have taken a look at it and been like, you know, is this, is this legit or not? None of those things ended up stopping it. Right. Yeah. So Laura, the podcast does, I think, deal with the passage of time very well. We hear Mm -hmm. about lots of FOIA requests being put in and we hear about hearings and we hear about And like Brian just tells us like this amount of time passed by and there's a lot of efficiency and yet you felt like a lot of the bureaucratic stuff was a slog, right? Oh, yeah. No, I, I tried so hard with this podcast, but I felt like it was so dense. It was like bogged down in bureaucracy. 
And during those periods that it was bogged down in bureaucracy, it wasn't that I didn't appreciate the reporting that was going on and the follow-up, but it had like no tension. So during those periods, I kind of lost focus. So I found this to be because it was so dense when we were going through all of those FOIA requests and small town politics and who's this person and that person and who said what and who did what and who was at this meeting and who was at that meeting and all of those things. The only time I could really absorb all of this is when I was doing something completely mindless. Like um, I was actually like scrubbing kitchen cabinets. I was like, okay, that was when I could absorb some of this material because it was it was really dense. And I, I felt like the minutia and the level of detail, I felt like they tried to jazz it up sometimes. Like, oh, now like Brian Reed is singing, ha ha. And like now Hamza is making a joke, ha ha, <laughs> you know. But at the same time, to me, it just felt like a slog. All right. So, Kevin, we need to skip to uh, the final episode of the podcast. Okay. Because the podcast does that. It skips to the final episode of the podcast. (laughs) After spending lots of time with documents and local government, we take a trip down under to chase a last minute witness that we only hear about near the end of the penultimate episode of the podcast. And we also meet our final big character in episode seven of the podcast, Ahmed. And we end up going to Australia with him to chase a witness that we only hear about in episode seven of the podcast. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of end loading of important facts to what is supposed to be a big finish. Yeah. Do you think this works? This is the only part for me that I thought the podcast faltered with. Big flaw. Yeah. Big flaw. But when you write a book, by the way, you know, you don't bring in a huge character in the last Two couple. huge characters. Two, well, yeah, Ahmed right. and Mark. And Mark. Okay, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, and it wasn't 100% clear to me what the possible stakes were on this, that he's he is a witness who could verify or deny seeing the resignation letters, or are we supposed to think that maybe he wrote the Trojan letter in defense of Mrs. Dar, who he uh, was really tied with. I, I don't know. But for a podcast that really was efficient, instead of taking us through an hour of listening to their f- different FOIA requests and the court hearings and stuff, and a lot of places A, B, and C, D happened, the, you know, an hour of flying to Perth and driving in a car and sitting in a car, knocking on a door. We went for lunch and came back. The envelope's gone. Finally. Some thrilling signs of action. Since we've been here this morning, the light wasn't on. The light is on now. Maybe you went to stay at a family member's house or friend's house. We sat there, idling, unsure what to do. Now I'm just bored. That was, like, really different than the rest of the podcast, especially when ultimately the setup is that nothing comes of it, right? So you got to end the podcast somewhere, I suppose. Um, I guess, you know, the lesson's about all three men, their faith is tested, Right, but I'm like, this is the end of the investigation. Here we went to Australia. Well, there's nothing left to do. To me, so we're done. Yeah, to me, the flaw here is this is the setup flaw. So there's two flaws here. One is introducing these characters way too late. The fact that there was a last minute witness should have been introduced way earlier, because then it would have been much more interesting. They were able to find him at the end, right? But if we knew earlier that there had been a last minute witness that had changed the course of the whole thing, if we knew that earlier. Mm then it would have been more interesting that we were able to find him at the end, right? Agreed, but only if it did that. Correct. The cur- this or, witness or, or, did not. Or they got a lead on him at the end, right? That would have been more is, They got a lead on him, but nothing. It, also, it wasn't big in the end. meeting Ahmed near the end, yeah. a mistake. He's a very important character in a literary sense in that he represents the old school of thinking, of immigrant sort of like mindset of like, this is how you're supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to think. You're not supposed to pursue and push back. You are supposed to accept and be at peace with the way that the systems are. Like That's the tension, right, between him and Hamza and the way that their sort of approach to the world is. To me, that's what the episode's about. Framing it as a mystery, as a chase, is the narrative mistake to me. I mean, only well, because it's, yeah. it's, it's inevitably going to be a letdown. Yeah, well, only because that. <laughs> only because that. I mean, but as a writer, you know that, right? Yeah. You've done such an excellent job of moving the ball downfield in a way that, at least for me, did not get bogged down anywhere. Yeah. And then, uh, then we have an hour where we're set up for. I you know, enjoyed a big the hour. That we're supposed to know what's going to come, <laughs> I and then the hour, yeah. So. Toby, did did you did you find those narrative flaws there too as we sort of approached the ending? Like, why did we not know about Mark earlier? Why did we not meet Ahmed earlier? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the Mark thing clearly 
they they should have foreshadowed that or, or or teased it or whatever earlier. I mean, with Ahmed, I I think they generally ran into him late, so it was hard to have him for other parts of that podcast. I mean, I don't know what teasing him gets you, but I, I thought he was a super compelling voice, right? I mean, it, it would have been great if they'd found him right away and he had kind of followed them along on all these things because I, I would have been interested in his perspective. Yeah. You know, it's like trying to make sense of, of what's the result of all this. And I think it's, it's hard to know, right? I mean, I, I don't think they, they come to much of a conclusion the one part I thought was sort of interesting and telling was when Brian asked Hamza, he's like, so wait, what are we going to tell him when he asks us like why we're here? And Hamza's like, this man, it's this. And like kind of lists out like why all this stuff is important. And Brian's like, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah now I remember. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for orienting me, man. <laughs> yeah. But it, but it was, I mean, I thought that was, you know, I mean, it kind of goes to what you've been talking about a lot, which is for Brian, it's like this story uh, and he's trying to remember like what what threads there are and what this all kind of means. And with Hamza, it's it's sort of more, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think he's he's got by sort of figuring this out, he's going to be able to you know shine a light on an instance of this much broader societal issue that they're in, and and then being able to prove it, like that's a big a big deal. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot. We charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. All right. Well, I think we should do what we do. Let's let our listeners know should they listen to the podcast, The Trojan Horse Affair? What do we think of it? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this latest podcast from our old friends at Serial Productions. What do you think? Laura Bricker, thumbs up or thumbs down for The Trojan Horse Affair? Let her rip, Laura. Um, well, this is this is hard for me because it's not it's, hard it's not, for you, Laura. Go no, ahead. I do it. I'm going to tell you the truth. I didn't like this podcast. But it's not hard. Um, <laughs> and it's and and so for me personally, my personal taste, I had a really hard time getting into this podcast. I had a really hard time following this podcast. I felt like this podcast was way too long for what it was. I felt like there was not enough tension to keep me interested in this. And, you know, I think it's a really interesting concept. It's a really interesting story. I liked the people involved. I liked the dynamic between the people, but just overall, eight hours of this, I just couldn't take it. So, you know, I think some people might love this. For me, it just wasn't for me. So I'm going to go a thumbs sideways because <gasps> there's nothing majorly wrong with this. I just really didn't like it. That's a thumbs down. I'm it's a arguing thumbs down. with you. You're a thumbs down, okay. Laura. I'm a thumbs I'm a thumbs down. I'm a thumbs down. Yeah. yeah I, didn't, I didn't like it. That's I didn't like fine. it. fine. When you don't like something, it's okay to be a thumbs down, Laura. It's fine. Own it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm owning it. I didn't like it. <laughs> Toby Ball. Yeah, I, this podcast like sets out to do and I think does a lot more than most of the podcasts I think that we review in that it's both looking at a story, but then also looking at a bunch of other things at the same time. And I think in Brian and Hamza, you do have sort of two different perspectives that help you kind of understand the way in these different other things that they're kind of looking at. Uh, how they play out. You have to focus. You have to pay attention. You know, I do this while I'm driving, and uh, for the large part, and, and sometimes I have to 
go back because I, I felt like I spaced like three or four minutes. But if you space three or four minutes, you may find them talking about something 10 minutes down the line and you're just like, what the hell is going on? So you got to focus. But I think if you do, at least for me, it seemed to really pay off. Again, I you know, the, the ending, it's not an ending that I think the rest of it kind of demanded. But I, you know, I, I, I'm a thumbs up and I, I think it's, it's, it's of a sort of quality that's like higher than a lot of what we listen to that we also enjoy. Kevin Flynn. I'm a big thumbs up for this. Like the best serial production podcast, it's really about the journey and not the destination. And we really get to hear a great buddy movie, really. These two guys sort of digging in and we, we hear a story, but also hear the making of the story. We get jazzed by their little discoveries and feel frustration for their setbacks. And they do acknowledge that they are two different people with two different outlooks. And they come to understand and respect each other and those outlooks and talk about it openly in the podcast. I think that it's it has the most pathos of any podcast I can remember in a long time. I just keep forgetting how sublime Brian Reed's storytelling is. And one of the major questions is, can this change anybody's mind? Well, I, I certainly would like someone to go and change the Wikipedia page on the, uh, the Trojan Horse Affair because uh, it doesn't mention a lot of what gets brought up and discovered in this podcast. Anyway, it's fantastic. I'm just going to call it that fantastic. Thumbs up. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big thumbs up for this podcast, too. And Kevin, I would say from our discussions around this podcast, it also changed your mind a little bit about your thinking about journalism a little bit. because These are conversations we've had a lot and the conversations with you that I've had around this podcast have been different about journalism than when they've been before. I think this podcast is important for that reason. The podcast is not perfect. It does, to me, have big editing flaws, storyboarding flaws. There are parts of the editing and storyboarding that are fantastic. There's incredible efficiency in the narration in terms of the passage of time and the terms of handling of some of the bureaucracy in terms of handling some of the big things that other podcasts would do very poorly. And then there are other parts of the editing and storyboarding that I think are flawed, that I don't think are Brian and Hamza. I actually think Brian and Hamza should have had more of a lead on how this went because the parts that they're in charge of when they're at the wheel are fantastic. My favorite parts of this podcast are the parts where Brian Reed gets a little bit of like back on his heel stuff when he learns from the real expert in the room here, who to me is this journalist who is learning at a time when journalism is changing for the better because journalism is broken. Objectivity is a bullshit construct that was made up by white men a hundred years ago, and it does not work. It does not like help the public in any way, and it is not truth because the truth is not objective. The truth is true. <laughs> and uh, Hamza, that's what he's trying to say in this podcast. And that's what I really think it's about. So when I talk about the flaws in the podcast, I'm talking about the weeds that maybe get in the way of that. But in, uh, in every other regard, I really, really enjoyed The Trojan Horse Affair. I think it's an important listen. I do think, though, that Laura's thumbs down is not unimportant. I don't think this podcast is for everyone. I don't think everyone is going to love it as much as I do or even like it a little bit. I, it was for me, though. So a thumbs up for me for the Trojan Horse Affair. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime of, crime of the, week. the week. If this Valentine's Day you're thinking about someone who's done you wrong, who's broken your heart, who is just a terrible person, why not throw them to the wolves? Now you can do that. For a $5 donation, an exotic wildlife rescue organization in Pennsylvania will put the name of your ex on a treat and literally feed them to their wolves. T&D Cats of the Wild has been doing this fundraiser for a couple of years. They're closed to visitors for the season, but you can watch your formerly beloved be devoured on Facebook. So, panel, <laughs> get as personal or maybe not as you want. Who will you figuratively feed to the wolves this valentine's day laura bricker let her rip who do you want to feed to the wolves 
Len Kaczynski. <laughs> <laughs> Your old friend. Uh, My old friend, Len. I've been thinking about cats. I've been thinking about Len Kaczynski. And I'm like, Len, you're going to the wolves. The old howdy doody of lawyers. Yep. Let's tell See about, you later. What about you? Who do you want to feed to the wolves this Valentine's Day? It's uh, a tough one. Uh, I'll go with Doc Ansel. Oh, very, uh, very yeah. good. What about you, Kevin? Well, I'd like to say Joe Rogan, but... Fuck you, Doug Evans. <laughs> uh, I'm going with um, jur- that juror from Suspect, uh, Jerry the Juror. Yeah, what about the, the jurors from uh, Believe Me? Them too, right? Oh, Believe Her? Oh, Believe yeah. Her, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I, I, I know what, I'm, I'm going to go with the juror from Suspect. That dude, man. Oh, fuck that guy. All right. Uh, Laura Bricker, folks want to reach out to you and continue to send their suggestions for what should be on the shingle outside of your office in Exeter, New Hampshire. How can they find you on Twitter? They can find me at Laura Bricker and uh, to be determined what they can find me outside my office. And Toy Ball, folks want to reach out to you and say, hey, what does that say on your T-shirt? How can they find you on Twitter? At Toby Ball and H. Kevin Flynn, what about you? How can you be found? I'm at Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On. And please join our amazing community in our official Facebook discussion group. Support the show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You'll get the Crime Writers On After Show, Married with Podcast, Lara Bricker's Leave It to Bricker Podcast, and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcasts. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the handsome Olivia Burdett. The executive producer of this program is the handsome Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our New Hampshire basement where we've accepted Laura and Toby's letters of resignation that they didn't even know they wrote. (gasps) On behalf of all the crime writers... We need your security, Fob. Thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. Later. Hey, man, Grandma Moses didn't start painting until she was in her 80s. Well, that's why she was Grandma Moses. <laughs> exactly. And not Daughter Moses. Yeah. Granddaughter even, Moses. even middle-aged, <laughs> middle-aged middle-aged wife Moses. Moses. Stepmom Moses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's a lot Moses. of possibilities there. <laughs> Cousin Moses. Okay. <laughs> Have you seen Cousin Moses? <laughs> oh Have you seen? Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.